Turn with me this morning to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to read there from the verse 12. First. Philippians chapter 2. We'll read from the verse 12 right through to the verse 18. Following the reading. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither laboured in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye rejoice, and rejoice with me. Amen. We know the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text this morning is taken from Philippians chapter 2 and the verse 13. It reads, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And my subject today, as last week, the sanctification of every true believer in Christ. Now this is the second part of the message. Last week I preached in the first part of the message. And then, under the subject, the sanctification of every true believer in Christ, we looked at the heading, the possession of salvation that's inferred. If you look at verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Underline the word salvation. Remember, the word salvation is a very wide and broad, comprehensive term. And despite what many think, this text is not an appeal to work for salvation. The text doesn't teach that. Think of the words, work out. It is not work for, or towards, or at. It's work out. The Apostle Paul is not preaching a works-based system of merit. Remember, he is addressing true believers. Those who have been born again by the Spirit of God. Individuals who are already saved by the grace of God and are part and parcel of the congregation that meet in Philippi. And we have to think of the word beloved. Wherefore, my beloved, the word wherefore means in light of this, in light of what he has just told them about Jesus Christ living a life of self-denial and self sacrifice the steps of his humiliation and then his exaltation wherefore my beloved and the word beloved of course um, is people whom Paul loves in the Lord Um, he loved them because that by the grace of God they themselves had become lovers of God And I just want to emphasize the point again this morning. Remember, the Bible does not teach salvation by works. 
So whatever Paul is saying here, it's not contrary to the like of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Think of Acts 4, verse 12. Now there is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And as we pointed out last week, that good works, good as they are, no amount of them can gain entry into heaven for any individual. Why? Because no amount of good works can deal with your sin. Remember, sin is the transgression of the law of God. God's holiness, God's justice demands payment and penalty for that sin. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The wages of sin is death, the Bible teaches us. And, of course, the payment and the penalty for sin that the broken law demanded was paid for in full by the death and the blood shedding of Jesus Christ on the cross. Therefore, there'll never be any booster in heaven who'll say, I got here on a works-based system of merit. Another reason why the Bible, of course, doesn't teach uh, a works-based system of merit for salvation Because if it did, it would totally undermine the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Remember, Christ offered himself a once and for all sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down in the right hand of God. And God accepted that blood sacrifice of Christ. And how do we know? Where's the proof? The answer is the empty tomb. And on the ground of the shed blood. The Bible teaches that we are accepted, not on a works-based system of merit, not because of church membership, not because of anything good in ourselves, but we're accepted in the beloved. And of course, the Lord Jesus is the one who's beloved of the Father from all eternity. So that was really the first point. And I don't want to labor it again. The second heading last Lord's Day was the progression of sanctification that is emphasized. You see, I want to make this clear that the words of Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 to 13 are dealing with the subject of the believer's sanctification. And sanctification, of course, is an integral part of the overall doctrine of salvation once we possess God's salvation then it becomes necessary to work that salvation out in practice every day and I pointed out to you that this is a personal activity work out your own salvation Every believer has a duty and a responsibility to be personally active in working out their own salvation. I told you it was a practical activity. It has to do with day-to-day living of the Christian life, whether it's at school, at the office, at university, or in the workplace and also in the home and in society. It governs every aspect of life. I I told you as well that it's a passionate activity. I think of the words here, work out. It could be a reference to activity in a gym, where you go there for bodily exercise, and you engage in self-exertion, and you put in loads of effort, and you push yourself to the limit, you set new goals, you, you achieve a personal best, you feel good about yourself. In other words, you're passionate about it, about keeping fit and losing a bit of weight, and, and, and people saying, well, look how, how, how good and fit I am. Well, well, in that sense, in the Christian life, This is not only a personal duty and responsibility that we have, not only something that we engage in in a practical way, but something that we should be passionate about. And and remember, this deals with indwelling sin, little sin, secret sins, open sins. We we have a hatred for sin. We have a love for righteousness. It it covers being sensitive to sin. And we 
uh, grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ, and part of that growing in grace and the knowledge of Christ is learning to, to hate sin, seeing sin for what it is. Sin's a transgression of the law. So our sins help to nail Christ to the tree, and therefore we, we, we turn from them. We're, we're, we're truly sorry for them. We're, we're being like Christ in that sense. And another aspect, and a positive note, it deals with nourishing spiritual graces. Second Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. There's the believer's activity. And then we thought about the believer's approach. It has to do with fear and trembling. Isn't that what the text says? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this is where we closed last week. We dealt with its meaning. It's nothing to do with a fear of losing one's salvation. It is a, a possessing an attitude of due reverence and regard to the Lord, whereby we, we want to serve him out of, out of fear, a, a filial fear, a fear of offending and grieving him. We, we do so with a, a, a spirit of trembling. Remember, he's the living and the true God, for the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we told you as well, the believer's attitude. Because the attitude would be to recognise this is going to be hard work. This has to be a heart work. This calls for honesty and humility before the Lord. This calls for a, a, a desire to have the same mindset of Christ. So we're willing for self-denial and self-sacrifice. We're willing for true humiliation. And that was all from last week. Now I want us to think thirdly. In this two-part message, the procedure of sanctification that's highlighted. Remember, we're dealing with the subject of sanctification. You see, oftentimes when people hear that word sanctification, we, we have to ask ourselves, well, what does it mean? I don't believe it's too difficult to understand, but I recognize that people have tremendous confusion in their mind about the meaning of the word. So what does it mean? How is sanctification uh, accomplished? Uh, how is it experienced in the life? Well, let's understand the meaning before we understand how it's accomplished and experienced in the life. <laughs> the word means to be set apart for a holy purpose. It also means to purge and to cleanse. And it's a reference to a spiritual and moral change that the Lord himself performs in one's life. And when we look at verse 13, you can't look at it in isolation from verse 12, because we're dealing there with twin truths. Let's take the two verses together. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For, and the word for means because. Here's why you're to do this. Here's how you're to do this. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now I want you to think of the commencement of God's work. If God is at work in you, then when did that commence? When did it start? You see, I believe the work of God in the soul has a beginning. It always must have a beginning. And when does life begin in the soul? The answer is very simple. In the new birth. Remember the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. And I asked this morning to young and old, has there been a time, a period in your life, when you began to understand, become conscious of, that you were born again of the Spirit of God? And I'm not saying that everyone must be able to easily pinpoint the exact date and time and day of the new birth. Some people can say I was there when it happened and I ought to know. And many others can talk about the year. And some people can say, well, well, I know it happened back then. And they may not be able to pinpoint an exact time and place. It's good if you can. But, but don't get hung up if you sort of feel, well, I don't have an exact date or, or, or time. 
The main thing is to know the reality of this experience, the commencement of God's work in the soul. Paul is telling us here, because it is God which worketh in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. And when did that work actually commence? It commenced in the new birth. You see, there's no such thing today as being a Christian without being born again. How many people in Northern Ireland say, oh, I'm a Christian. I go to church. They're thinking about membership of a church. But if I press them and ask them, are you born again of the Holy Spirit of God? Many of them would say no. Think of Christ's words to Nicodemus. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Nicodemus was a very religious man, a member of the Sanhedrin Council, a very respectable man, a very righteous and upright man. And yet despite his religiosity, his respectability, despite his religion in a sense of rites and ceremonies among the Jewish people, that despite being involved in the leadership of the Sanhedrin, he was informed by Christ, even you, Nicodemus, you must personally be born again. I'm well aware that there's a great abuse of the biblical doctrine of the new birth. We could think of this example not so long ago when Volkswagen, I don't think it was a Beetle, but it may have been a Volkswagen Golf, and they were having the slogan that the Volkswagen is born again. Here's a reason to buy a Volkswagen, because it's born again. Nothing to do with a spiritual and moral change in the life of the motor car. What did they mean? Well, of course, they took that biblical expression and they uh, changed its meaning because they for thinking about the Volkswagen as being refurbished or revamped or, or, or retuned or refined. But I want to tell you the new birth is not about turning over a new leaf. It's not about correcting oneself. It's not about reforming your life, trying to be good. It's not getting a new suit of clothes and a new haircut. I, I remember a man coming into the Coleraine Church many, many years ago, uh, a, a Mr. Love, and he sat for weeks in the services he heard the gospel he didn't bought himself a new suit of clothes he got his hair cut he got a shave and uh, of course he sang with gusto and praise in the uh, worship part of the service he carried his bible he listened intently to what was being said and yet he thought by this outward conformity that he was being like everybody else in the congregation and that he was now a Christian and he was in membership of the church and I remember on one occasion he was informed by the minister then that he personally needed to be born again of the spirit and he testified well I thought I was a Christian I didn't know that I needed to be born again and he mentioned his suit and his hair cut and shaving off the beard the beard etc etc there's no such thing as being a Christian without the experience of the new birth. And what is the new birth? It's the work of God in the soul. It's God implanting the principle of life, divine life, within your soul. And God's work commences in the new birth. I want you to think of um, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. And maybe this will link it up. Um, Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And there's a reference, Philippians 1 and 6, to begun a good work in you. And when did that good work begin? It began in the new birth. And what is the new birth? It is God by his grace infusing a principle of new life within the soul. And once, now listen to me carefully, once that new life is infused within the soul, then with that new life becomes a, 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 a principle that flows from it, and it's a principle of holiness. It's a principle of sanctification. It's a principle of living a, a righteous life. God creates within that life a desire for God. 
a desire to love God, a desire for holiness and, and righteousness and, and sanctification, whereby we become like Christ. Think of a little chorus, to be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like him all through life's journey. From earth to glory, all I ask is to be like him. And what was Christ like? Well, if you turn over there to the book of Hebrews, look with me at Hebrews chapter 1. And here, here's a very important reference. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This is what Christ was like. Christ loved righteousness and he hated iniquity. It was the great George Whitfield who preached hundreds of times in the subject of the new birth. And when he was challenged as to why he always preached on this subject, he answered with the text of scripture, you must be born again and once we're joined to Christ once we're in union with the Saviour as our covenant head once we begin to possess God's salvation once we're born again to, by the Spirit of God and made alive to God we're no longer passive what we're brought into now is an ongoing experience whereby we're purged from our sins, we're cleansed from our sins, an ongoing experience of sanctification. Remember, this is addressed to believers, <coughs> not to the unregenerate. And via the new birth, God implants the principle of holiness in the heart. And in that very basis, the Apostle Paul issues this plea. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For because it is God that worketh in you both the will and the do of his own good pleasure. Give the earnest attention to your Christian life now. Give, give a, a passionate response to a life of holiness. Because you're no longer passive. That's good. That'll wake me up. We're no longer passive. We've got a duty. We've got a responsibility in the Christian life. You in the Christian life, if you're born of the Spirit, you're to be fully involved and fully active in living out that Christian life. You have now the potential to pursue a life of holiness. And of course, this is a, a process. It's a, as we said last week, it's a progressive work. It's something that's ongoing. It, it, it's a, something uh, that you will engage in to the very end of your days. So there's the commencement of the work. I, I want you to think, secondly, I want you to think of the comfort <laughs> of the work. Look, look at verse 13. It says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see, if I take the two together, when you get this plea coming into your ears, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and you realize this has to do with the progressive nature of sanctification, then you're going to think to yourself, but, but I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to make it all the way home to heaven. There's sin in my life. And I'm going to fall. And there's going to be areas where I fear. And, 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 and I'm going to fail the Lord. And therefore sometimes we're plunged into guilt and despair. We're going to face many dangers and snares. Remember we've got the enemy called the devil. We've got the enemy called the world. We've got the enemy called the flesh. And they're all at work. And they're trying to bring us down. And they're trying to destroy our testimony. And what I'm saying to you this morning is not only the commencement of this work, but the comfort of this work. Let's remember in the Christian life, God is at work within our soul. To me, these are encouraging words. To me, these are, are marvelous words. To me, these are comforting words. How can I work out my own salvation with fear and trembling? How can I be involved in this ongoing progressive work of loving righteousness and hating sin? <coughs> 
Here's the answer. It is God who is at work in you. You see, there's a promise here. There's also a power here. The Christian is industrious. And his industry is not on the basis of his own strength or ability. He is now active. He is personally involved. He is passionately engaged. All because God is at work in his soul. And God is by his spirit given that individual the power, the grace, the incentive. Think of the words both to will. That, that has to do with the desire. Where does the desire come from to go to church on a Sunday? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But where, where does that desire come from? But where does that desire come from? come from throughout the week to call on the Lord in a time of prayer? Where does that desire come from to read your Bible every day? Where does that desire come from to, to say no to this sin and that sin? And we could talk of a whole host of areas. That desire comes from the Lord. It's not your own strength or power or ability. It's not your own mindset. This desire for a holy life, this desire to hate sin and love righteousness, God has given it to you. And not only does God give the desire, not only does God give a, an incentive, but, but notice something else. Both to will and to do. The very strength to do it. It comes from the Lord. Now, now there's encouragement here. Maybe I could just add this little bit. Here's how you know you're genuinely and truly born again of the Spirit of God. You've got a desire for God. You've got a desire for holiness. You've got a desire for the work of God. You're passionate about Christ and his cause. And even though at times we're weak and feeble, and even though at times we feel and fall, that desire is still there. And even though we feel and fall, we can bring our sins to the Lord. Remember, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we bring ourselves to the Lord and say, Father, I have sinned. Forgive me. And where did that come from? That comes because God is at work in the soul. And I have to say this morning, many prof professors of the Christian life, that those who pretend that they're Christians, they know nothing of the grace of God at work in the soul. They can comfortably and happily live like the devil. They play church on a Sunday and think, well, I've made a profession of faith sometime down the road and I, I still think that I'll, I'll go to heaven at the end of the day. But I, I don't want to live a life of holiness. I, I have no time for uh, going to church every Sunday and reading my Bible and, and living a holy life. I want to do my thing. I want to do what's right in, in my own eyes. And I, I want to stress this morning, here's how you can know that you belong to the Lord. Here's one of the little assurances. God is at work in you. God gives you the willingness, the desire but also God does this in your very soul by his own strength and power. Can you see that? This is not optional. If you have no desire for God and know that God is not at work, then there's something wrong. Remember we read in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter um, uh, 12 and I think it's the verse 14, Hebrews 12 and 14, and we read this. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. The word follow there means pursue, actively pursue. And what are we to sue? Just like a hunter goes after a prey, like after a, a young man uh, pursues a young woman for a period of courtship and a hand in marriage, were to pursue holiness actively with a desire and a doing. And Paul says that's the work of God in the soul. And there's the comfort. 
of God at work. One final thing. I want you to think of the cooperation of God's work. How do you and I fulfill our duty and responsibility in relation to the Christian life and all the outworking of its aspects, the Lord's Day, relationship to the Word of God, relationship to prayer, relationship to holiness, relationship to witnessing, uh, so on and so forth? We're so weak. We're so sluggish. We're, we're so fearful. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, well, what can we really do for God? And here's the answer. We're involved in a partnership that's really unique. Because it's God that creates the desire, the want to do something. And it's God that gives the ability to do it. And we're really only working out because at the same time, God is at work in me. And God is always at work in me. So in my learning for, about him, in my living for him, in my loving for him, in my loyalty to him, God is at work. So my loving, my loyalty, my living, my learning is because of this unique relationship. I want to do this. I'm able to do this because God's at work in my soul. This enabling and training work. See, let's remember that all the strength and the ability and the desire that we have, even the craving for help at times, it all comes from God. And here's how we fulfill our duty. If you turn over there as we come to a conclusion to Isaiah 26, and look with me at verse 12. Isaiah 26 and verse 12. Here's a great reference that you could underline this morning. Isaiah 26 and 12. Lord, thou will ordain peace for us. For thou also hast wrought all our works in us. There's a corresponding text to Philippians chapter 2 and in the verse 13. Lord, thou will ordain peace for us. For thou also hast wrought all our works in us. It's not his works, it's our works. And all our works, he has wrought them in us. Can you see that this morning? For those who have had the joy of ever visiting the land of Holland, I've never had that. It's a very flat country and they have very little by way of cars, although they probably have some cars, but I'm told they have as many bicycles as they have cars. And the vast majority of bicycles are not push-a-button start bicycles. They are bicycles that are worked by pedal power. But it's not just pedal power alone. You could sit in the bicycle and the bicycle wouldn't move, young people. You'll never get from A to B by just sitting in the bicycle. The bicycle won't start by a push-button. It has got no engine in it. And what you have to do when you hire out the bicycle is you have to start pedaling. All right? And then when you pedal, the more you pedal, the power comes to the bicycle by means of a battery charge. And as you pedal, your bicycle is charged to go forward. And that's the very principle that I'm getting at. That's the cooperation. Once we become passionately and practically involved in the Christian life, and adopt the mindset, I must work out what God has worked in. What has God worked in me? God has worked salvation in me. And as I work that out, I remember this. For it is God that works in me, both the will and the do, of his good pleasure. And over there in the book of First Thessalonians, in Thessalonians chapter 5, in the uh, verse um, 24, it says... Faithful is he that calleth you. He also will do it. And what will, the, what will the Lord do? The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. Faithful is he that calleth you. Who will also do it. And that's a tremendous thing to realize. Here's the commencement of this work. Ask yourself this morning. 
Have I been born again of the Spirit? Have I got the infusion of life within my soul? Is the principle of holiness within me? And here's the comfort. I'm not left to my own strength and ability. God's at work in my soul. And that gives me encouragement and assurance that I am his, despite my weakness and, and failures and follies by times. And then I remember there's a cooperation involved. I'm brought into a unique relationship, a, a unique partnership. As I work, God works. And yet ultimately, it's God that gets the glory because God is at work to start with. May the Lord take these few thoughts this morning and bless them to you. It was too much for last week and we left it off and I've tried to elaborate a little in bringing home the fullness of the point. There's many aspects of sanctification that we haven't dealt with, of course, and we'll be dealing with it a little later on in this study.